everyone, welcome back to the 160th anniversary of the Battle of Gettysburg. I'm Chris White, we have Gary Edelman behind the camera, soon to be on camera, and we're down in one of his favorite places on any Civil War battlefield, and that is the famous Devil's Den. And Devil's Den is, if you've never experienced it in, in real life, it even this picture here doesn't do it justice. This is the place where every kid wanted to come to, like I did when I would come here as a kid, run around the rocks, you know, wear your hat, bring out your fake gun and run around here and just jump around. But over time, I became to, came to appreciate it much more and more for what it actually is. And it's a really cool geological uh, specimen here on the Gettysburg battlefield. If you've been on the first day's battlefield, you'll come from the Gettysburg Plain where it's relatively flat. You don't see too many rocks. You'll see rock walls and things but then you start to move down to the south end of the field and the topography down here changes dramatically and right in this area this is probably one of the most um well, one of the areas that stands out the most to any visitor but this is one of the places that you truly need to get to and Gettysburg National Military Park has been refurbishing this so that we all can enjoy this portion of the battlefield as well as Little Rantop behind us. And before I bring on Gary, let me just bring you down from the 5,000 feet or the 50,000 feet level down to the 500 foot level. So it's July 2nd, 1863. We have had fighting on the first day north and west of the town. The Union Army falls back to a position on Cemetery Hill, Culp's Hill, and then a low ridge called Cemetery Ridge, which will eventually uh, bring their line to and around a place called Little Round Top right behind Gary. Confederates in the meantime have basically, uh, think of silly putty or jello that if it comes around the sides of the Union Army, they're kind of morphing all the way around the Federals. So where, where the Federals come up into this large J or fish hook as we call that, the Confederates kind of do the same thing. So they're kind of forming around the Federals. But unfortunately for the Confederates, they have to work on exterior lines and it takes a long time to move from the left to the right. And the Federals work on interior lines. So that means they have a shorter line of distance. On the afternoon of July 2nd, 1863, Robert E. Lee launches an attack that is gonna hit the Union left flank. Now, most people think that whenever the Union left is hit, it's hit at Little Round Top first. In fact, the fighting will launch from Warfield Ridge out behind me, come down into a valley past the Bushmen and Slider Farms, and then eventually hit here at Devil's Den, where you'll have uh, John Hobart Ward's brigade down here, the Union Third Army Corps, we'll have James Smith's artillery fighting against John Bell Hood, and Texans and Georgians and Alabamians who will be all down into this area. And then from here, units will go up onto Little Round Top. Others will go over into the wheat field and still more will fight here in Devil's Den. So that's what it's gonna look like here. This is where the fighting on July 2nd, 1863 really comes to life. So to talk about that, I'm gonna swap spots with Gary Edelman, bring him on and grab the camera from him. You see, we are a substantial crew of many today. Hello, everybody. Thanks so much, Chris. Thanks so much for joining us for Gettysburg 160. And one thing we're doing this year is trying to focus on eyewitness to Gettysburg. So, you know, let's bring us up to speed. Before we get right into the fighting, there was a lot of eyewitness accounts of this very place beforehand. So maybe, uh, maybe Chris can just walk around and through these rocks. And I'm going to read a few things as we stroll nice and slow um, around. So let's just do this. I know you can hear me. So Chris, start walking along the rocks here, if you will. I'm going to start with... And as Gary finds his page, I just want to point out that Gary and I shot a video last year um, with GoPro cameras. So if you're interested, you'll get a dual perspective of Devil's Den using GoPro cameras here, as well as up on Little Round Top. And I like that. And for the last, I think the last seven years straight, we've also shot anniversary videos here, including some where we follow the whole Confederate attack and others where we just walk around here. Um, the first thing I want to talk about, uh, to, uh, Chris mentioned this already, uh, and that is that in 1906, somebody wrote an article to the paper called Found Tomahawk. It says, while showing some friends through Devil's Den the other day, John Thorne found a tomahawk in a crevice of the rocks, which had probably been there for a hundred years. The relic gives the den a little more historic interest concerning the earlier haunts of the red man, it said. Um, there's also a lot of old stories, and one of them says, and this is from Emanuel Bushman, who you know, is a guy who had written a lot about the old stories of Gettysburg. He said, there's an old tradition that an Indian hunter was passing the Big Rocks, uh, that was his name for Devil's Den, and a huge black bear came out from a cave and sprang upon him with his capacious mouth open to take in his head. The Indian thrust his arm down his throat and partially choked and tore out the bear's entrails. The Indian's arm was terribly lacerated. They both struggled until they were glad 
had to quit. In a day or two, the Indian brought uh, a member of his tribe and they tracked the bear to a pine tree for it had snowed. Uh, so they found the bear in that case. Um, one more. Um, Another from Emanuel Bushman, he says in November of 1806, Father Henry Bushman with two of the Armstrongs went coon hunting after rambling around the hills a while without much success. They got cold, it being a cold night. They made a fire against the big log to warm themselves near the big rocks now called Devil's Den. When they were thawed or warmed out, there was a gust of wind or whirlwind came down from the hollower valley. The leaves of the trees were nearly all down and dry. The wind scattered the fire among the leaves in every direction. And soon all of Round Top was in a blaze. We have so many accounts um, from the early settlers of Round Top. It's these folks who, you know, sort of talked about snakes being in the devil's den. Uh, it's these folks who talked about the evil spirits that were inhabiting the rocks in the 1800s. It's, it's all of our early stories come from these locals, but none of them wrote before 1863 about this place being called Devil's Den. This is a name that appeared within days of the Battle of Gettysburg, and it is now forever known as Devil's Den. That's the whole general area. There's a cave down there that is specifically known as the original Devil's Den or the Devil's Den. Now, what I'm going to ask Chris to do is cut here. We're going to walk a little bit around here, and then we're going to pick up with some other accounts. So um, why don't you cut here, Chris, and then let's walk to the next spot a little, and we'll take it from there. As we're walking in an area now called the top of the den, uh, this has been restored. You see the nicer uh, sort of pathways here and uh, hopefully it'll help control the erosion. Um, well, here's one description I always like to the area. Um, this is from 1873 from Gettysburg's first historian's book, John Batchelder, What to See and How to See It. Evidences are that by some mighty convulsion of nature, this ridge was rent asunder at its intersection with the base of Round Top, thereby draining an extensive body of water in front of Little Round Top. The gorge thus produced is called the Devil's Den. It presents a scene of the wildest character. Huge cyanetic boulders are crowded into this narrow ravine through which struggle the waters of Plum Run, while yawning chasms suggest to the visitor the haunts of the lurking sharpshooters who occupied them during the battle. And all of these things just led on to what we call the lore of the sharpshooter. If there's a photo taken here of a dead soldier, of course that soldier must have been killed by a sharpshooter. There aren't any organized groups of sharpshooters around here in the first place. This really took off, as did something called killed by concussion, where one photo was captioned as if a soldier, there was not a mark on his body, and he was thought to be killed by concussion until everybody who fought at Devil's Den was killed by a sharpshooter or killed by concussion. This place, Devil's Den, has been more subject to more myth and legend than perhaps any other place at Gettysburg and maybe, maybe any other place of the Civil War with the exception of Cold Harbor where almost everything everybody knows is actually myth. Yeah, one of the things I want to add uh, to what Gary was saying that John Batchelder's book is actually available if you go to archive.org um, and it's interesting to, to look at these early guides to uh, battlefields. It's not just for the Civil War. We'll see them for the World Wars and others. Like Michigan, uh, Michigan, Michelin will um, create a large number of guidebooks for the first World War battlefields. One of the things they wanted to do is get people back out after the World Wars, especially through France, but they also wanted to sell tires. So if you had to drive around to a lot of different places on some really terrible roads, you'd have to buy more tires. But it's always interesting to see some of these guidebooks, these ones that were written in this, uh, just after the Civil War or after the World Wars to see what it looked like just after the battle had ended or the war had ended. Um, so if you ever get a chance to check out Batchelder's book, as, as Gary pointed out, he is the first historian of the battlefield of Gettysburg, or the official one, and he meets with hundreds of veterans, um, writes to them, comes out to the battlefields, doesn't always uh, agree with what he says or they say, but it's a fascinating insight. Uh, Chris, if you could hop uh, onto this rock, not hop, but carefully get yourself up on this rock here. I'd like you to look out to the valley while I read the next account for, nice, you can't see that, but Chris did that in one big leap and bound. Uh, this area is known as the Valley of Death, that area between Little Round Top uh, and Hawks Ridge or Devil's Den. So we're looking at this now. There is a Union artillery commander, a guy named Henry Hunt. You've heard of him. He's in command of all the Union ar artillery, at least nominally here. And he was very concerned about some of the cannons being placed behind, be, in front of me, the 4th New York Independent Battery, James E. Smith's guys. Smith had an intense fight here. I'll just tip the hand by saying that he said those 40 minutes were so intense that each of those 40 minutes had 60 seconds in it. And each of those 60 seconds in every one of those minutes was crammed a lifetime. 
In any case, he was very concerned about Smith's position. Smith had his position over there, and Hunt picks up the story. Satisfied with Smith's position, I descended Hauk's Ridge. I left to seek infantry support, very doubtful that I would find my horse, for the storm of shell bursting over the place was enough to drive any animal wild. On reaching the foot of the cliff, and that's over there, somewhere, um, I found myself in a plight at once ludicrous, painful, and dangerous. A herd of horned cattle had been driven into the valley between Devil's Den and Round Top, from which they could not escape. A shell had exploded into the body of one of them, tearing it to pieces. Others were torn and wounded. All were stampeded and were bellowing and rushing in their terror, first to one side, then to the other, to escape the shells that were bursting over them and among them. Cross I must, and in doing so, I had my most trying experiences of that battlefield. Could you imagine being in charge of all the Union artillery here that hosted the largest artillery bombardment um, known by mankind before Pickett's Charge? And this was his most trying experience. Just like at Antietam, those soldiers who got chased and swarmed by angry bees, that was their most trying experience, not what they did next, charging the bloody lane or the sunken road. So keep this in mind. Uh, you know, he also said he was badly demoralized by this experience of getting to his horse, but get to his horse he did. Better yet, we have photos taken from Little Round Top that show cattle in the valley of death. So when things like that come together, man, is that just great. Now, I do want to get into the fighting here, but we're going to require a pause as we hop off the rocks, and we're going to go over to a place now known as the Triangle Field or Triangular Field. Looks like Chris is still rolling there, so let me say that right to my front left there, that's a place called Bennings Knoll. That's because Henry L. Rock Bennings Georgians came up over um, that hill there. We're talking about the second Georgia mainly there, maybe elements of the 17th Georgia. So Bennings Knoll, and in front of us, we're looking toward the triangular field. Gary, I'm curious, who, who named Bennings Knoll? Well, that, that was, you know, Messrs. Smith and Edelman, who, by the way, wrote this uh, book. This is the old cover, Devil's Den, a History and Guide, 1997. Can't believe it's been that long already. Let me tell you, it's hard to get a name to stick. Very, very hard to get a name to stick. So I keep calling it that in hopes that other people will use it eventually. We're going to walk around this way. By the way, we just passed the famous dead sharpshooter position. You're probably familiar um, with that already. That's where a uh, rebel sharpshooter, actually, let's do it here, home of a rebel sharpshooter or rocks could not save him is the name of this um, photo. You can see the photo right there. You see the wall and then mainly the two framing rocks on both sides of it there. Good job, Chris, putting that right through. There we go. Um, so um, this is not locked off for long. It's just that the, the grass and vegetation didn't take <coughs> during the, uh, during the uh, planting season, early spring. So they're going to have this blocked off until the vegetation actually takes. Yeah, it's important to, to remember that the park is undergoing restoration. This is for the longevity of the park. Um, so this is so that future generations can come out here like we're doing and explore it and that uh, it will look like it did in 1863. So the park's done a great job here. You may have been familiar with the tree plantings that went on you know, probably more than a decade ago now. Um, and then of course they're working on a little round top as we speak. So this is very vital. And it's one of the missions of the National Park Service to, you know, protect all of these resources, historical and natural. I think that's great, Chris. Uh, some of you saw too, I mean, it's not just preserve, it's not just interpret, it's protect. And uh, the park is concerned with the long-term longevity. So the inconvenience, and trust me, it is tough to not go on little round top at will. Um, but these are things the Park Service actually needs to do. Um, so, by the way, we just walked under the shade of a witness tree, and here we are looking, approaching Rose Woods, definitely host to the mo more casualties than any other uh, woodlot in the entire Civil War, um, right there. Before we turn left here, note that in the Gettysburg movie, <laughs> there is an artillery battery out here. This is one of the only places in the whole movie where something was filmed where it actually happened. Even the little round top scenes are uh, shot elsewhere, and those shot on the real little round top are representing big round top, look for our coverage that we've been releasing slowly but surely about the Gettysburg movie. But those woods appear in the movie because this is where Confederates uh, under John Bell Hood overrun the Union Battery. That big rock you see there is in the movie, as are these trees here, which is kind of cool. 
Yeah, one of my ancestors that. actually is one of those <coughs> casualties uh, from Rose Woods. Wow, and what unit is that? Uh, he's in the 140th Pennsylvania. 140th PA, yeah, and we have a video on that from Gettysburg 159, if I'm correct. We do. Now, so setting it up here, the Union line is now behind me. There are cannons on the hill behind me there, and um, we have um, uh, Confederates coming up this way. Texans in front of me, Arkansans in the woods over there, and of course, famously, the 124th New York, the Orange Blossoms, on whom? Uh, the Red Badge of Courage is almost certainly based, are going to charge into this field, shock the Texans, but then the Texans regroup along with Benning's Georgians, 20th Georgia namely, are going to come into this field. Watch your step there, please, sir. And the Confederates are going to push back, capture the guns, um, you know, lose the guns, recapture the guns, and the Southerners will capture more guns here than anywhere else. Three of the seven Union cannons that they carted away from Gettysburg um, were captured here. Let's pause here because now we're on the Confederate sort of size, side on the wall, and maybe I can get Chris to look up already. Even here, look at the nature of this declivity. I cannot even see the ground of most of Houck's Ridge behind the upper wall of the triangular field, and we haven't even gone all that far down yet. You'll be able to see, as, as Chris pans left, the uh, monument to the 124th New York. That's Augustus Van Horn Ellis um, up there, actually. Uh, but uh, you can just see that this is a good place to be, to take position. But the Confederates couldn't just take this position. They had to advance beyond it. That is their charge at this point. Now, speaking of their charge, here we have it. I'm going to show you a rare moment. Here's a page in the book because you can see the commander uh, striking the same pose that he has on the monument. That's Augustus Van Hornellis. Here's his young major, James Cromwell. Both of these uh, soldiers will be killed in this fighting in short succession. Uh, Ellis killed right after. He says, your major's down. Save him, save him. He rides, rises up in the saddle, and he will be killed toppling head foremost among the rocks. One, one member of the 124th said, the conflict at this point defies description. Roaring cannon, crashing riflery, screeching shots, bursting shells, hissing bullets, cheers, shouts, streaks, and groans were the notes of the song of death with, which greeted the Grim Reaper as, with mighty sweeps, he leveled down the richest field of scarlet human grain ever garnered on this continent. Um, there's another one that's actually similar to this when you actually have... Um, the 44th New York actually charging up in this, I'm sorry, 44th Alabama. They're going to come from that direction. Half of them go into the Valley of Death. The other half come up here and nail the flank of the 124th New York. See, the 124th come in here. Here comes half of the 44th Alabama and three soldiers of the 124th New York, Company B on the left, I'm going all company level, actually referenced this sort of deadly flanking attack. But the uh, <coughs> commander, a guy named William F. Perry actually was totally exhausted and completely laying down, prostrated among the rocks. And he said, buried in the recesses of the rocks, I could only hear. It is seldom that a soldier in the midst of a great battle in comparative security and perfect composure can enjoy the privilege of listening. The incessant roar of small arms, the deadly hiss of mini balls, the shouts of the combatants, the booming of cannon, the exploding of shells, and the crash of their fragments among the rocks all blended together in one dread chorus whose sublimity and terror no power of expression could compass. So now we are looking over across the triangular field. You might be able to see the slider farm off in the sort of center left distance over there. And above that is Warfield Ridge that Chris referenced earlier. You take that farther to the right, that's Seminary Ridge. So after the Texans, that's Robertson's Brigade and the Arkansans um, advance, they're joined by Alabamians, but it's not enough. The Union's getting some reinforcements sent to this area. And here comes Benning's Georgians. Now we have some longer accounts, but I'm going to do little bits sort of a uh, mixed together here. Um, you know, so some of the men charged and, you know, you've got all sorts of things. You've got the Union cannons behind us opening up upon the Confederates even as they're starting to join into the fray. One guy, it seems to be badly wounded, but it turns out that Dick Childers' uh, uh, biscuits were just scattered everywhere from his haversack. It hit his haversack and he was so distraught by the loss of his food that he never exactly forgot it. Um, the uh, 15th Georgia and the 1st Texas come up here yelling like devils as they came up. When the 20th was, quote, nearly halfway up the hill, one of these shells exploded in front of the regiment, a fragment of which, glancing from a rock, passed through the brain of Colonel John A. Jones, killing him instantly. This shocked the regiment. Their colonel had behaved with great coolness and gallantry uh, all day and was killed just as success came into sight. Another Georgian, actually, his horse was shot, and its commander, William Terrell Harris, actually leapt from the saddle as the horse was falling 
falling dead, and he pulled his sword in midair and hit the ground running and continued from there. Um, the 20th Georgia continues. One, a guy named Loki said, in going up the hill, um, uh, he remembers passing Colonel Jack Jones. He was laying on his back with half of his head shot off. The next came upon a man from Company K. He next came upon uh, lying on the ground where he had uh, sought the protection of the crest of the hill. He was not shooting, but lying as close to the ground as he could get. Loki passed by. He said, you better not go up there. You will get shot. Loki said nothing, moved to the top of the hill. He'd thrown up his old Enfield rifle uh, and was taking deliberate aim at a Yankee when a mini ball passed through his right thigh. I felt as if lightning had struck me, he said. My gun fell and I hobbled down the hill. And as he limped back, he met the same soldier who'd given him the advice on the way up. As he passed, the man said, yes, that's right, everybody, you guessed it. I told you you would get shot if you went up there. Loki's response can only be imagined at that point. Now here comes the second Georgia going off to where Chris is pointing to there, forward in splendid order. It came to a deep gorge where the nature of the ground was such that it was impossible to preserve an alignment, but notwithstanding the rocks, undergrowth, and deadly fire of the enemy, the officers and men of this regiment moved forward with dauntless courage, driving the enemy before them. Uh, they would eventually come into a story you've heard me tell many times where they noted a line of blue-coated regulars shooting down into the valley of death, down into the gorge from a top devil's den, and two of the men were shot through the top of the head by the almost vertical fire. The accounts go on and on. Um, there's just so many battle accounts. I want to encourage you all to look at our devil's den videos from the last six years. Um, you'll hear more about the 1st Texas, more about the 3rd Arkansas, more about all these units at devil's den. I tried to focus on others that we don't focus on every year here. But what Devil's Den is really known for, beside myth and legend, is really the terrible aftermath that was here. So we're going to uh, pick up at another spot here. Uh, um, Chris will probably mute me while, I, while we walk to that next spot, and we'll be back. I think a lot of us, hopefully I'm unmuted, a lot of us are under the impression that, you know, if I was at Gettysburg, I wanted to fight at Devil's Den, or if I was in the Civil War, you know, my ancestor was lucky enough to be at Gettysburg. I think some people say that tongue-in-cheek, and those in the know know that this is the last place you want to be. The famous battles tend to be the most horrible battles. Uh, sure, there might be some sort of glory or victory associated for your ancestor or for one side or the other at certain battles more than others, but everything I know about Devil's Den, I'm obsessed with this place, and I would not 
like to have been here. I don't think I'd like to witness it even if I had the opportunity for. People talked about people dying in every possible um, contortion. People talked about coming upon uh, Confederate soldiers in the woods as the Union advanced. Those on Little Round Top, those coming in the next day, advanced to clear the woods of Little Round Top and came upon Confederate sentries only to realize that some of the Confederates had actually died leaning against trees, their uh, sightless glassy eyes still looking down the barrels that would have sent messengers of death but they were actually shot first. Another one talked about coming upon the dead who had clearly uh, twisted leaves and writhed in their agonies and their mouths had filled with soil. They had literally bitten the dust. This place was particularly horrific because it was about the last place cleared of its dead, furthest from the town, hardest to dig because of all the rocks and rocky soil, even where you see soil, apparently there's rock underneath that soil here. So it was basically the last cleared of its dead. That meant that putrefaction um, and decomposition had really taken hold. And of course, you've got the photographers around here taking photos before all of these dead are buried. And what we see in the photos isn't anything from what I understand compared to the actuality of it. Imagine the smell. Imagine the groans of um, people upon experiencing this level of death. And then imagine it right after the battle when there was four wounded for every soldier killed um, here in the first place. Um, one Georgian in the 15th Georgia guy named Fluker said, we began to realize we were surrounded by death and suffering that no pen can picture. Our deadly determination of a few minutes before to destroy life had changed to sympathy and sorrow for the suffering ones about us. And we went to their relief as whole souled as we had gone to their destruction. The groaning and wailing on this battlefield will never be forgotten by those who were there and who heard it. But for the cries for water, water, and the peculiar wailing of others that had no semblance of a human cry will ring in our ears until they cease to respond to sound. Um, uh, just picking a few um, at random here. Um, they were talking um, about some of the aftermath and it said at one spot a point either of desperate resistance or formation for an assault 37 dead bodies lay in a line side by side in confederate clothing their uniforms were better than usual and they all had new black slouched hats doubtless from the stock of some neighboring dealer in front of these bodies lay an officer of fine proportions manly physique and remarkably handsome features his head rested upon a stone his limbs were straightened his hands folded he had evidently been prepared for a decent sepulcher um, sepulcher, sorry. Um, a letter through which the ball had passed penetrated his heart, identified him as Captain William A. Dunklin of the 44th Alabama. Another says, a newspaper correspondent, on July 11th, the last of the rebel dead on the battlefield were buried only yesterday, July 10th. A week after the battle, they were principally found near the foot of Round Top Ridge where some of the most ter terrible fighting of the battle took place. The bodies numbered about in all 50. Decomposition had progressed so far as to render it impossible to handle the bodies at all. And the graves were necessarily dug close side by side just to complete the work. They also talked about a lot of the bodies having to be retrieved from the chasms of the rocks themselves and retrieved they had to be with meat hooks um, in order to get them out. So wedged in there they were. Others were tossed unceremoniously into Plum Run where they choked up in certain points. It's hard to imagine and I don't think I want to imagine it any more beyond that. So when we come to battlefields, note that battlefields are cemeteries. They were cemeteries until the dead who had been buried there were removed. And on most battlefields, they failed to secure <clears throat> any information about where all the dead were. And therefore, battlefields remain cemeteries to this day. People interact with battlefields differently, and that's okay. People, I certainly didn't know how to act the first time I was on one. And veterans themselves, they had fun. They um, got serious. They memorialized. They remembered uh, their comrades and everything. And I think that the way you interact with the battlefield is important in a personal experience. So we hope you're doing that already. We know we go out on our battlefields and get all excited. I think there's a time for reflection um, as well. And this is one of those places, even as you climb along the rocks, know that you're climbing in what was and almost certainly is a cemetery. The last remains that were found at Devil's Den were in the mid 1920s. So it's been 90 uh, plus years since, uh, or 90 or so years since any more remains have actually been found here. But I, for one, don't doubt they're still around. Maybe at this point, what better place for them? Chris, thanks for shooting. Thanks for the introduction. Um, thank you all for watching and supporting, preserving places like this and educating the public about places like this.